Welcome back. Chapter 28 begins the fourth and final part of the 1605 novel. It opens with hilarious praise of our ingenious Hidalgo. Most happy and fortunate were the times when the audacious knight Don Quixote de la Mancha ventured forth into the world. The passage not only parodies the tone of the romances of chivalry, it ends with a powerful dose of literary criticism, forcing us to reflect on the content and the form of the novel. Cervantes is at pains to justify his text's confusing structure. He argues that we all need cheerful entertainments, emphasizing the sweetness of his true story and also of the tales and episodes it contains. Then he continues its torturous, twisted, and reeling thread, turning our attention to the mysterious voice that had interrupted the priest's attempt to comfort Gardenio. Another unfortunate soul has been hiding in the Sierra Morena because there is no remedy for its ills. Cervantes continues to play with appearances in the novel's last phase. The priest, the barber, and Cardenio seek the owner of the lamentations and find a boy dressed like a farmhand who is washing his feet in the arroyo. There's something odd about the narrator's description of the boy's feet, which seemed no less than two pieces of white crystal that had flowered among the other stones of the stream. For the Baroque period, this is sensual stuff, and it does not correspond with the garb of a peasant. Curiously, the priest beckons his two friends to crouch down, and they spy on the boy. Cervantes describes his clothes, and at some point, after drying his feet, the farmhand looks up, and they are struck by an incomparable beauty, such that Cardenio says to the priest in a low voice, this, since it is not Lucinda, is not a human, but a divine being. How sad, I was sure this would be Lucinda. By the way, this scene is a modern version of the classical myth of Diana and Acteon. What follows reads like an hallucinogenic parody of Botticelli's Spring. The boy removes his cap and releases such long and beautiful tresses that, according to the narrator, the sun would envy them. At that point, everyone realizes that the farmer is actually a woman, and the strangest detail is that her hair covers her entire body except for her feet. Otherwise, our three voyeurs can only see the woman's two hands, which seem like shards of packed snow that she uses like combs. Recall the innkeeper's wife's comb. Okay, enough. What we are contemplating here has become overly erotic. So the three come forward, and naturally, the startled woman tries to flee, grabbing a bundle which seemed to be clothing which she had next to her. She stumbles, and this gives the priest a chance to calm her. Wait, lady, whoever you are, for those you see here only intend to serve you there's no reason for you to take such impertinent flight. We'll return to the issue of impertinence in chapter 32. For now, note that the priest's comment is odd, for it would be reasonable for a woman to flee in these circumstances. Once again, the priest asks someone to recount their misfortunes. Our curate seems experienced at confessions, because although at first the girl is fearful, according to the narrator, just like a rustic villager who is suddenly shown weird things that he has never seen before, she soon calms down and, putting on her shoes with great modesty, she seats herself atop a rock and tells her story. The girl disguised as a peasant comes from a town in Andalusia. Again, the text doesn't say exactly where, but critics suppose this to be Asuna. In her town, there also lives a duke who has two children, the youngest a traitor, like Bellido or Ganelon. The girl stresses that she comes from a wealthy family, but without a title. Again, contrasts between the lineages of peasants and nobles are at the center of a love story, except that this time, race is a more explicit issue. She says her parents are farmers, common people, without any inklings of an inferior race, and as they say, the very oldest of old Christians. But so rich are they that, 
by means of their wealth and their magnificent ways, they have gradually come to acquire the status of hidalgos and even aristocrats, caballeros, a rich family in the process of rising to the rank of nobles. This girl is also a talented accountant and administers her parents' estate. She states that she was the steward and mistress of the household. Servants were hired and dismissed by me. The direction and accounting regarding what was planted and harvested was done by my hand. The oil mills, the wine presses, the number of cattle and sheep, that of the beehives. Wow, call me bourgeois, but I find it difficult to imagine a more attractive woman. Beauty and intelligence, an explosive combination. And there's more. In her spare time, she is adept at the needle and the pincushion and the distaff. That is, every aspect of sewing. That symbolic thread again. She also plays the harp. Music composes emotional excesses and alleviates troubles born of the spirit. This is true, although Plato would disagree. And now that I think about it, not all music has this effect. Something ominous invades the girl's narrative when she tells us that she lived enclosed, as if in a monastery, and that she only left home to go to Mass accompanied by her mother and servants. At such a time, she was seen by Don Fernando, the youngest son of the area's duke. When Cardenio hears this name, he is upset. He changes color and begins to sweat. For a moment, the priest and the barber think he is going to have one of his bouts of madness. But he just stares at the peasant girl. Strange, no? Could Cardenio be cured? 